My beloved brothers and sisters, I express to you my affection, my love for each of you, and I appreciate the love you send in return. I would, li I would like to express thanks to Dr. Lee for that beautiful prayer, and I hope that that can extend to me from all the hearts that are gathered here to this morning. My beloved brothers and sisters, we're delighted to greet you this morning, to welcome you to the Brigham Young University, and to wish you well in this exciting new academic year. This is a wonderful time in your life. As Victor Hugo once wrote, youth even in his sorrows always has a brilliancy of its own. That brilliance always sparkles in the eyes of students on this campus, and that is one of the reasons I love to come to the BYU. But of course, we ought to be happy here. We ought to sparkle and shine and radiate with brilliance. We have everything. When I, a prominent Eastern man who was visiting our offices asked me, why are, why are you, the Mormon people, such happy folks? My answer was, it's because we have everything. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the light, the priesthood, the power, the promises, the covenants, the temples, our families, the truth. Latter-day Saints, especially Latter-day Saint youth, surely should have a brilliance of their own. You should have that sparkle here today. I've entitled my remarks this morning, On My Honor, and I intentionally included in that list of things that make us happy, our promises, and our covenants. May I concentrate there for just a moment? To do so, I wish to refer to two other greetings you have recently received, one from President Oaks and one from Commissioner Holland. I quote the first from President Oaks. He spoke a personal letter to you dated April 6th. It was almost, it was a most important letter and having so recently received it, you surely have it still fresh in your minds and in your hearts. It contained a message that must be remembered. It said in part, quote, we look forward to having you as students at BYU this fall semester. We're proud of high standards of scholarship, personal conduct, and appearance at Brigham Young University. We hope that all students and their parents will join in our determination to maintain these high standards. Each student who enrolls at BYU promises to observe all of the requirements of our code of honor, including our dress and grooming standards. We expect each student to keep his or her promise. Please examine the enclosed card and brochure so you will be thoroughly familiar with those requirements. Sincerely, Dallin H. Oaks. And uh, that brochure to which President Oaks has referred, I quote these remarks from Commissioner Holland. Those who come to a college or university within the church educational system enter a special environment of scholarship and student activity. That environment un uniquely reflects the standards and moral commitments of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And every student makes his or her own contribution to that spirit on this campus. To facilitate your understanding of our church educational system, 
dress and grooming standards with which you will be expected to comply. This brochure has been prepared for you in advance of your arrival on this campus. Your presence will be felt as you honor these commitments. I wish you well in an educational adventure which will be as important to your spirit as it will be to your mind. May God bless you with a wonderful fact-finding and faith-promoting experience. May you be an, enable you to bless your own lives as well as the lives of others by following the teachings of his only begotten son who gives each LDS campus its unique light and life. With best wishes, Jeffrey R. Holland. Those statements by your school administrators reflect the direction they have received from the Church Board of Education and the Brigham Young University Board of Trustees. They did not manufacture these ideas on their own and no amount of lobbying will force them to change. In these instructions to you, their own loyalty and integrity are at stake for they are acting in behalf of the presiding authorities of the church who direct them. Your loyalty and integrity are at stake in your willingness to abide by that council. You have come here on your honor. Included in this material received from your school administrators, you may have been a little surprised to find a greeting from me on this same subject. May I repeat that expression of love and interest this morning. It is introduced by a phrase I suggested to your older brothers and sisters, and in some cases maybe your parents, long years ago, who attended this university more than 25 years ago. I suggested then, and I suggest again this morning, that Latter-day Saints should have a style of their own. In that written greeting to you this summer, I said, we can create a style of our own. The world has drifted a long way from the standards of cleanliness and body and soul but we have such faith in our young people that we are certain that if they are properly advised, they will always be well-dressed and well-groomed and free from the sins of the world. They will thus avoid the pitfalls of the adversary and retain their virtue and worthiness. Forward is forearmed, forewarned is forearmed. One factor con contributes to immodesty and a breakdown of moral values is the modern standard of dress and grooming. We must be different. We need not do anything we do not wish to do. We can create our own style and standards. We can influence the patterns along among our own people and we can also help to develop proper community patterns. Some young people have prided themselves in wearing the most tattered, soiled, and grubby attire. If we dress in a shabby or sloppy manner, we tend to think and act the same way. I am positive that personal grooming and cleanliness, as well as the clothes we wear, can be tremendous factors in the standards we set and follow on the pathway to immorality and immortality and eternal life. It is my understanding that each student who enrolls in this great institution and its sister church institutions understands before coming here what the rules and regulations are. And he or she signs the enrollment sheet with a firm promise to obey those rules and regulations. For a young woman to wear a short skirt or other immodest wear when she has covenanted otherwise would not be a matter of cleverness in escaping detection, but a definite blot 
on her character. Should any young man promise to observe certain standards of dress or hair length or behavior and then evade those instructions and restrictions, certainly his error is deep-seated and is not just a difference of opinion. It is nothing to joke about but a black mark on his character. He hath ears to hear, let him hear. Over the recent Labor Day weekend, President and Sister Tanner and their family had a reunion up at Bear Lake. There were 61 family members present. Sunday evening, one of the members in the area came up to the President Tanner's home and asked to shake his hand and say a word to him. She said that earlier in the day, she and her husband had been discussing the proper observance of the Sabbath day. They decided to watch the Tanner clan during that day. They saw all the men and the boys get ready and go to priesthood meeting in the morning. Then the whole group went to Sunday school and later in the day to testimony meeting. She said that after seeing this, her husband remarked, well, I think I'd better go in the house and put on my suit and tie. You see, my young brothers and sisters, the powerful influence of a good example at, <clears throat> at all of the meetings during the day, all 61 members of the Tanner family had been well-groomed, well-dressed, and in their Sunday best. Provided this school so that it may be enjoyed. We are delighted you're here. We love you and are grateful that of the hundreds of thousands of college-age youth in the church, you, of that large number, are able to attend the BYU. But please remember that there is no compulsion for you to come, and you have done so voluntarily. The terms under which you have registered are definite and firm. There is no forum for argument or appeal about the personal standards we expect you to maintain. Those have been stated, and you have agreed on your honor to abide by them. We have every confidence that you will. We realize that there are many other universities in the land some of which are far less stringent about their regulations. It may be that their location, their faculty, their courses, their leadership are more agreeable to you and that you would be happier there, but we hope not. In any case, since you have pledged on your honor to attend this school under the standards we, are, we have predicted, then it would be most untrue of you to accept the church's heavy financial support of more than two-thirds of your education and then default through unfaithfulness. If I could not agree with the rules, I would hand back my registration slip and say, no, thank you. Since I cannot agree and since I do not intend to live the rules, therefore, I will not pledge something that I will not do. Or I would say, I have decided to dress immodestly or wear my hair inappropriately. Therefore, I will find a school which will accept my standards. Or I would say, I will not keep the law of chastity or the word of wisdom or some other commandment of God. Therefore, I will seek a school which does not require me to so pledge. I will not enroll. I will not sign to do one thing and then do another. That is what my integrity would make me say if those were my feelings. Sister Kimber and I have eaten at many restaurants where it was required of the men to wear a coat and tie. And in those circumstances, I say to myself, if we wish to eat in this restaurant, I will keep my end of the bargain. I will keep my end of the bargain by wearing a coat and tie. 
If I were uncomfortable with the rule, I would go to another restaurant where there is no such restriction, or I could even go without a meal and altogether. But I promise you, I would not bolt through the door tireless and demand to be served. Furthermore, and far more seriously, I would not put on a tie at the door, find myself pleasantly and courteously seated, only then to tear off my tie and coat and, def and defy the waiter to eject me. Why would I not do such a thing? Because my honor and my dignity and my integrity are more important to me than any meal, however splendid the banquet. If they ask me to wear a tie, I will wear a tie or refuse on my honor to enter. I invite you to exercise your integrity in the same way on this campus. I assure you that you do not need to wear a tie at the Cougar Eat, but, <coughs> <coughs> but some things we do require in dress, in dignity, in manners and morals. These have been clearly stated and by these you are honor bound to abide. Your integrity and your and my integrity require it. Obviously, what we say to you here applies to Latter-day Saint students everywhere they are, at home or abroad, as well as our faculty, staff, and administrators. I know one man who nearly moved heaven and earth to get a position in this institution, the BYU, and then having accepted the position, the salary, the requirements, he began at once fighting the rules, complaining at the salary, criticizing the leadership and the program and its philosophy. To me, he was not only unfair, he was immoral. And we we're opposed to immorality at this school and in its sponsoring institutions. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints asks that you keep your promises to be faithful to, faithful to your covenants and live by your standards and to represent what the sacred tithing dollars invested in this school must always represent. I ask you to do so on your honor. After a message like this, I hope none of you students hand back your registration slips. None of the faculty resigns. We want you not only to stay, but to love every minute of your experience here. We would like you to feel comfortable about these rules and regulations, these codes of honor, and this discipline. They are a part of what we hope to teach at the university. We would like you to see these standards as tools with which you can build a better self. But of course, they must be respected as tools and care should be exercised so you do not inflict unnecessary self-injury by abusing yourself against them. Many of you know the feelings of missing a nail and hitting your thumb with a hammer. Hammers were designed to drive nails, not to drive thumbs. <clears throat> These standards at BYU are designed to build character, to teach discipline, to symbolize propriety and restraint and honor among the students, the faculty, the institutions as a whole. We would hope you would not to spend your time banging your heads against these regulations. They were not designed to create dissension on, or to make you unhappy or angry. Please respect them as you would any tool and use them for their intended purposes. We would be disappointed to think that they would cause you undue difficulty. As the Lord said of the word of wisdom, these regulations too are adapted to the capacity of the weak and the weakest of all saints who are or can be called saints. We believe everyone can live them without anxiety or hardship. <coughs> Excuse me.
Some of you will recall in almost every general conference, I have encouraged our Latter-day Saints to mend their fences, to fix up and paint up, or else tear down their old barns, to trim their hedges and to repair their garages. In many places throughout the world, we have reports of those who have repaired and repainted, restored and improved. We are greatly heartened by these responses. As the Lord said, it does indeed please the eye and gladden the heart. My father always expected neatness around our farm. As a boy, one of my jobs was to soap and oil the harness, hang up the collars and bridles on the pegs in the harness shop. The survey had to be the Surrey had to be washed, greased, and painted regularly, too frequently to suit me. I asked, I asked my father, why wash the buggy? It'll just get dirty and dusty again after the first mile or two, but I made no impression on him and had to do it anyway. <laughs> when I painted the buggy, it had to be perfect. No smudges or crooked lines. I had to whitewash the fence and paint the rose trellis green. Then I had to paint the barn, the granary, and the harness shop. He insisted that everything be neat and clean and in good repair around the house and around the farm. One of the great spiritual uplifts I get in visiting this campus is from its immaculate appearance and beautiful grounds. I commend the grounds keepers, the maintenance crew, all, including the faculty, the staff, the administrators, and the students who share in this pride and make this surely one of the most beautiful campuses in the world. I frequently am visited by people from far and near, and they've been to the campus here. They have nothing but praise, and it pleases me no end. I drive down into the valley and see the temple against the hill and this great campus, including the missionary training center. I think of the Lord's promise to us that ye are the light of the world and that it is set on the hill which cannot be hid. Surely this campus is in its own way a small city set on the hill which should not be hid. It's beautiful. The walks are clean. The windows are shining. The hedges are trimmed. The grass is carefully cut. The walls are not defaced. And care is given every detail of appearance. Visitors from all over the world come here and comment on its beauty. And that, of course, makes us very proud. But more important to me than the appearance of our buildings is the appearance of our students and our people, our Latter-day Saints. By here speaking so directly and emphatically about something like our dress and grooming code, I hope you sense our far more important concern for people's appearance. Barns and gardens and woodsheds matter less, but people matter more. People bear a great eternal spirit as well as a God-given body, and the two unite to form the soul of an eternal man or woman. The appearance of the eternal soul with all of its outward manifestations surely takes precedence with us over the important matter of nearly painted, newly painted homes or barns, carefully re repaired fences, as important as they are and as clean as we must keep them, those homes and fences will someday be gone, but you will never be gone. You will always matter and you appear and what you represent and the integrity of your covenants will always matter. For all that we believe about gardens and grassland, about painting barns and cleaning ditches, we say anew and more vigorously to all of you, 
trim your hair appropriately, wear modest, clean clothing. Your clothing does have, it doesn't need to be new, but it must have, uh, must have some fashion, of course, but they should be clean, modest, and neat. Be dignified in your outward appearance and in your manners and in your inward morality. Take pride in your principles. Tear down, as it were, any of the old sheds of the past. Repaint, uh, repaint of old transgressions and start this school year with clean hands and a pure heart, Re reflected by good grooming, acceptable apparel, and personal integrity. Let, let me confess one of the sad disappointments I sometimes feel. I want you to know it is hard for me to be even disappointed, to be disappointed, and I rejoice in the blessings of the Lord daily. But a few things disappoint me occasionally, and one of them is in the returned missionaries who, after two years of taking great pride in how he looks and what he represents, returns to this campus or other similar places to see how quickly he can let his hair grow, how fully he can develop a mustache and long sideburns and push to the very margins of appropriate grooming, how clumsy his shoes get, how tattered his clothes are, how close to being grubby he can get without being refused admittance to the school. That, my young returned missionaries, brethren, is one of the great disappointments in my life. I mention it to the missionaries when I see them in their missions, that they will retain their pride and their honor all the rest of their lives, wherever they go. I meet with prime ministers and presidents, with sovereigns and rulers, political and public figures all over the world, and one of the things they inevitably say about us, and always with warmth and appreciation, is this. We've seen your missionaries. We've seen them all over the globe, in every state of every union, of the union, in most countries of the world. Without exception, they look like young men ought to look. They are clean cut, neatly dressed, well groomed, and most dignified. My, that makes me proud. I'm trying to do my own little part in missionary work, and that kind of comment makes me so very proud of our 26,000 missionaries. Then sometimes these great leaders say, your missionaries look like just the kind of young men I would want to take into my business, or in my government, or in my embassy, or in my law firm. Sometimes they even say, they look just like the young man I would like to have for a son-in-law. <laughs> and that makes me proudest of all. <laughs> Please, you return missionaries, and all young men can understand my concern in this matter. Please do not abandon in appearance or principle or habit the great experiences of the mission field when they were like Alma and the sons of Messiah, as the very, the very angels of God in the people you met and taught and baptized. We do not expect you to wear a tie every moment after you get home, or a white shirt and a dark blue suit, even every day now that you are back in school. But surely it is not too much to ask that your good grooming be maintained, that your personal habits reflect cleanliness and dignity and pride in the principles of the gospel you taught. We ask you for the good of the kingdom and all those who have done, all the good you've done and yet do take pride in you to live both the letter and the spirit of your dress and grooming and conduct codes. In the spirit of your mission commitments, I ask you to do it on your honor. 
There's a story told of President Brigham Young who having urged the people of certain communities to properly dress and clean their premises, he refused to go back to preach to them saying something like this, you didn't listen to me last time when I urged you to fix up your premises. The same doors are off their hinges, the same barns are still unpainted, and the same fences are partly fallen. I will return when you're ready for an, the next sermon, but you haven't done anything about the first one yet. Now I don't intend to refuse President Oak's annual invitation to speak to this delightful audience, but this story does tickle the imagination. I suppose that next year at this time I could ask President Oaks to give me a report on hair length and skirt length, if the former is still too long, the latter still too short. I guess by President Young's standards, I should not return. And after all, we do know those we do know whose name this university bears. Can you see President Oaks frantically trying to trim a young man's mustache or, at, or attach sequins and patterns to the girl's pair of faded and worn blue jeans? Well, I'm sure it won't come to that, and I would like to be invited to speak again, but even though we smile, it is a very serious matter to me. I would be... It would be nice to think that some, that uh, sermon number one is being lived before we start sermon number two. Let the words of the Lord linger in your memory as I leave President Young's story with you. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? We sincerely hope every student and faculty and staff member and administrator will give heed. Long years ago, one great man, Carl G. Mazur, known to be associated with this institution, first president of the Brigham Young University, wrote this, My young friends, I have been asked what I mean by word of honor. I will tell you, place me behind prison walls, walls of stone ever so high, ever so thick, reaching ever so far into the ground, there is a possibility that in some way or other, pardon me, I may be able to escape, but stand me on the floor and draw a chalk line around me and have me give my word of honor never to cross it. Can I get out of that circle? No, never. I'd die first. Like some of the very sophisticated recording equipment I hear in your rooms, we not only need fidelity on this university, but we need high fidelity. We need great faith on your part, for we live in a time of temptation and opposition. Allegiance to the straight and narrow path of Christ is crucial and it has implications far too far beyond a dress and grooming code or a stated paragraph of moral behavior. We live in a day when our allegiance is being sorely tested. Satan is succeeding too well in many places, and he succeeds when we entice any person to excuse himself in wrongdoing. Almost all dishonesty owes its existence and growth to that inward distortion we call self-justification. It is the first, the worst, and the most insidious form of uh, cheating. We're cheating ourselves. When Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus as he fought against the truth, the resurrected Savior made this telling observation. To Paul he said, It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Note who is hurt. Note the principles. Not the truth, not the church, not even the Christians who were in opposition. 
Finally, ultimate, ultimately, it was Paul being hurt. This is hard for thee, Paul, to kick against the pricks. In a latter-day revelation, the Lord explains that the same thing is true of us whenever we undertake to cover our sins or to gratify our pride or by vain ambition. Then the heavens withdraw themselves and the Spirit of the Lord is grieved. Before we are aware, too, we are left to kick against the pricks, to persecute the saints, to fight against God. And like Paul, unless we repent, it will be we who are left damaged and bruised by the failure to conform. It will be hard on any of us when we do battle against the truth. It's a glorious privilege to be attending this, the greatest university in all the world. The other day I had a, a book handed to me by a very important businessman who was writing his journal. And when he came to a certain place, he said, I went one year to the Brigham Young University, the greatest university in the, all the world. And he said, it's a wonderful church and it has great people in it and great standards. And it pleased me very much to know that this man, who was not especially uh, faithful to his activities in the church, but he still remembers his years at the Brigham Young University. It's a glorious privilege to be attending this, the greatest university in all the world. There isn't anything else like it. Have you ever traveled? If you have, take a good look and, an, and analyze carefully. And when you take the important points and sum them up, you come out with this final uh, thought that Brigham Young University is the greatest university in all the world. There are universities with larger faculties more extensive faculties. There are institutions which specialize in more specific areas of the arts and the sciences. But Brigham Young University is designed to enlarge and develop the powers, the spirits, and educate you for eternity. Here you have the privilege of preparing yourself for life's vocation, and at the same time combining theory and practice in preparation for eternal life. Here you prepare to make a living, but more important still, you prepare to live toward perfection, toward exaltation and godhood. This institution has no justification for its existence unless it builds character, creates and develops faith builds character, creates, yes, and makes men and women of strength and courage, fortitude and service. Men and women who will become stalwarts in the kingdom and bear witness of the restoration and the divinity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is not justified on an academic basis only, for your parents pay taxes to support state institutions to which you are eligible in every state of the Union, and most foreign states have some opportunities. This institution has been established by a prophet of God for a very specific purpose, to combine spiritual and moral values and secular education. Keep your promises, my young people. Maintain your integrity. Abide by your covenants. Give the Lord this year and every year your high fidelity and the fullest expression of faith. Do it on your honor and you'll be blessed now and forever. God bless you. It's a joy to be with you. Peace be with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.